last time on Bad Bobbers. Our group of adventurers, along with their NPC cohorts, Professor Brelinor Berkeley and Amy, Barlam's niece, broke into the Mage's Tower, belonging to a wizard named Elros, who has been missing for quite a while now. The party met his housekeeper, a wax golem, who Barlam snuck past and made too much of a commotion, so they decided just to melt her. Barlam decided to set fire to a bunch of books, then everyone found some kind of monster monstrosity that looked like a bunch of apprentices had melted together and so they promptly beat the hell out of it. <laughs> yep. Hello and welcome to Band of Bothers, an actual play Pathfinder podcast. And with me today I have our usual cast of colourful critters, Twemus. Who are you? What are you doing here? I am a Finnish bloke and I'm playing Barlam. He is a middle-aged rogue in this game. And yeah. <laughs> Sounded a bit robotic there. I am I do. Barlam. Please help me do. Hello. 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 Didn't you know everyone from Finland are robots? Everybody from Finland are robots. They uploaded their brains into robots. Robots and obtained immortality. Hello, please insert coin. Okay, so Ed, what are you doing here? I don't know, I kind of just sat down and now I'm involved in this. I'm Ed and I play Alpheus the Doge Man Wolf Shaman and I have a wolf with me called Snuffles. Joe, who are you? My name is Josephine. I play Frida the Half Elf Druid with my companion Teapot the Wild Lioness. Alrighty, and finally, Pete. Hello, I'm Snork! Wait, no. Oh, yeah. Hi, I'm Pete, and I play Snork! <laughs> He's a goblin fire mage. And I have chicken. Great, very professional, you guys. Love it. So, we continue where we left off. You have just defeated the gibbering mouther. You have successfully cleared the first floor, the third floor, and the fourth floor. You kind of skip the second floor, and you've got the top floor above. So, how would you like to proceed? How did I join? I forgot. I was chasing the chariot, wasn't I? How did you join the group? <laughs> yeah. Snork was busy because his dog ran off pulling his chariot, and he had to go get it back. That's me. Right. Didn't we already check the whole tower? You've checked this floor. These were the apprentices' quarters, and there's nothing really there. It's largely destroyed. You fully looted the master bedroom, and the lab, which was on the second floor, you chose to skip because there are a bunch of eldritch mutants that are bound to a magic circle in the middle of the lab. But, according to the notes you found, there might be some worthwhile information, and I believe Amy suggested you go back because if there's going to be magical trinkets anywhere it'll probably be in there. Is there a stairs upward? Yes there is a stairs upward. Uh, eh. I don't like towers. Too many stairs. We could always explore the second floor on the way back down. Yeah let's Maybe. check the next floor then. Like next floor up. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. Let's go upstairs and punch whatever's up there. Wait. I'll check for traps. I'm really not looking forward to finding out, considering what that thing was. So, Barlam, you're looking for traps? Roll me a perception check, please. So, perception. Perception. That's 13. So, you start heading up the chairs, look, the stairs. Chairs? <laughs> up the chairs. Wow. You start climbing the chairs. You stack them and walk on top of wow. them. Wow. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's a balancing act in itself. Yeah. yeah, it's the most inconvenient way of building stairs, I suppose. Up the chair of commerce. You climb the stairs looking for traps as you go and you don't find anything yeah you get to the top where there is a hatch that leads into this final area so you think that this must be the top i'll open it and raise my cap and say top of the tower to you whoever's there roll me a disabled device to unlock the hatch 23 this is pretty easy so you unlock the hatch you open up to the top floor poke your head out take your hat and go top of the tower to you oh <laughs> <laughs> what a nice weather we're having. Oh, 
God. As it happens, there is someone at the top of the Ooh. tower. Hello. You see at the top of the tower a steel cage and a lever contained within the cage. There's another small tower on top. And sitting on top of the cage is a beautiful young woman with raven black hair dressed in a simple yet form-fitting dress. She sees you say top of the tower to you and she smiles and she's like, well, hello there. I'm glad to see you're all alive and well. Snork's just staring at her with his tongue rolled up. Aww. You also uh. you also see next to the steel cage there is a table with a tablecloth set up. There's like a pot of tea, there's chairs set up, there's little doilies and cakes and scones and cream. Everything you need for an afternoon cup. Is this like a Mad Hatter situation? Is she a bit, you know, off in the head? No, she's just into something kinky. Just make a sense motive check. She's sitting on top of the cage. You're not in the cage. Yeah, that's what tipped me off first. Uh, 18. She seems perfectly sound of mind to you. She looks like she was waiting for you. And now that you're there, she hops off and Jess is like, come on up, the tea should be ready now. Uh, one question before that, as I'm still like, only my shoulders are visible and my head from the hatch. I ask, who are you? By the way, the rest of you, you hear him talking to someone and you hear someone talking back. A disembodied <laughs> voice. Oh, where are my manners? I'm Andrea Sagath. Of course, Alpheus probably remembers me as Mother Sagath. Uh, I closed the hatch. <laughs> <laughs> she, the uh, Mother Sagath. It's, it's, it's the bacon witch. Yeah. yeah. I closed the hatch and lock it. Oh, come now. I'm not here to harm anyone. I just want to talk. <laughs> Is she speaking through the hatch? <laughs> I can more. She's speaking through the hatch. <laughs> I open it again. <laughs> I'm just here to talk. I'm not here to harm anyone. And you were with us to talk. You stalked us. You gave us weird portents. I speak this in a loud voice so that Alpheus can hear me. You gave my friend the Dogo some weird bacon and tried to seduce him with bacon again. She can seduce me with bacon. Well, <laughs> she's got cakes. Cake! <laughs> How does Snork know? Snork's got a very good nose. Yeah, but I push him back by the nose. <laughs> <laughs> well, in all fairness, whilst Alpheus is the one with really good nose. Snork being a goblin has massive ears, so he probably heard her say she's got everything ready for the afternoon tea. She said the tea's ready, there's cakes and scones. Okay. So, how will you assuage me? Assuage? How can you promise that you are not going to do anything weird? Because you are on top of a cage. No, she's off the cage now. You have a tea party on top of a tower which has traps and monsters, so... I set this up as soon as you took down the shield so that when you got here, we could have a chat, because it seems to me that you're about ready to close the portal. We've been, unfortunately, on opposing sides in this conflict and I'm not really happy about that, so I just wanted to clear up some misunderstandings between us. What do you mean you are on the other side of the conflict? What conflict? By the way, you are aware that Esme was tied to Sagath in some way. Mm -hmm. Well, you've had a few run-ins with my late apprentice. Yes. Hello! Oh, wait, no, not me. And uh, no, Esme. No. So, what can you possibly offer us? Mm. Besides tea and cake, apparently. Yeah. A good look at those buns would be nice. <laughs> I look down from the hatch to Alpheus <laughs> like, fair point, yeah. It's terrible, you... <laughs> I'm just here to talk, just share some information, and you can air your grievances. Uh, maybe we should lick her buns. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <sighs> Are the iced or? She starts pouring herself a cup of tea. I'm even starting if, um, to wonder about transitioning to the dark side. But um, <laughs> as I hear my compatriots snicker, I walk up and open a trap door. Sigh. If you're going to try anything funny, I say as I keep the latch open, I am going to have to destroy you like I did your uh, daughter. It's true. He threw a roof tile at her head and everything. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm fully aware not to mess with you lot. You've proven yourselves to be more than capable. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually left a bit to myself. I am just here to talk. Mm. That's all I'm here for. I take a seat and pointedly do not take any tea. So the rest of you, are you coming up to the top floor? If the door's open. Yeah. Uh, yes, following <coughs> Barlon. Um. <laughs> oh, is this like a step ladder, not a flight of stairs? No, it is a flight of stairs. But there's just a hatch to the top of the tower. Yes. Okay, so I'm not lugging a line up a step ladder. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Alpheus goes in warily. I look over my shoulder at Alpheus with the case that says do not take any bacon there's no bacon here. even if they are inside muffins 
but look, they have doilies. Nope. <laughs> oh my god. I keep my lioness behind me. Mm. There's too damn many animals in this party. I let my chicken go peck the buns. Too many damn animals. <laughs> I shout to disguise. That's not meant to be a euphemism. I actually do let my chicken go peck the buns. Well, maybe we just need you to get a familiar if you become a wizard. <laughs> <sighs> I might just choose a bonded object be like, Okay, Ring, it's best of you not to move. You bond yourself to a rake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is my pet rake. That'd be great. Or a stone. <laughs> I can... Oh, oh a pet... No, it could be plank like Ed, Ed and Eddie. No, no. Like a pet brick. I can use it to throw at people and kill them. No, no, no that's just being silly. Yeah, that's true. So you have a pet rock. Or a coconut, maybe. Rick the brick. A prick? No, Rick the brick. A brick. <laughs> Rick the brick. <laughs> I'm well aware that one can be bonded with their prick, but I choose a brick. Yeah. Really, you, you should just bond yourself with a chair. Then you can just sit down and listen to our shit every day. Oh, yeah. A magical chair. That's a really good idea, actually. A flying carpet. No, a chair. I choose a chair because that can be made flying as well. I, I want a flying carpet. I'm going to trade my chariot dog in for a flying carpet. An umbrella. No, chair. I, I've already decided. Anyway, yeah, my chicken goes and pecks her buns. Yeah, she, the buns are there. The chicken seems to be enjoying itself. They're and soft, they're pliable. My chicken's enjoying itself on her buns. Oh, I'm sorry. She's finished pouring herself a cup of tea and she's just minding her own business, waiting for everyone to come in. So, Steve, as a DM to a DM, what snork just said I'd penalise some XP for that just <laughs> as a note amongst DMs oh don't worry he'll get what's coming to him oh yeah right that's good it was my chicken that ate the buns not me yeah I'm just keeping my lioness close to me I'm just keeping my distance yeah Alpheus doesn't sit he's kind of there probably leaning against one of the walls near the food not on the food or anything just near the food I say to Alpheus sits Alpheus sits near the food no no not near the food like away from from the food because you're not getting anything off the table Alpheus rolls towards you oh. are we sitting and eating with this bitch or what <laughs> so you're all up there she'll pour tea for anyone who wants any there are little cakes as well as scones there's clotted cream and jam it's quite a lovely little thing the weather's nice as well and a nice view on top of this tower as well so this would be lovely is this like an open top tower or is it yes, like yes last... you're on the roof oh okay this is a bit weird oh that is very weird so that wall you're leaning on Alpheus is not a uh, wall no, it has the raised fencing, as it were, that's at the top of towers. The crenellations. Ooh, fancy words. So, now that you're all here, <laughs> first of all, I would like to apologise for Esme. Uh, she was a very troubled young woman, and hopefully now she can find peace from her demons. She kind of was a demon. Yeah, she kind of was a demon. She was troubled. You took the orb from her, so you have some idea of what it was that she saw that kind of drove her to be that way. No one knows what it's like to be as me. Yeah. So wait, are we are we with this woman or what are we doing with this woman? I don't know. I'm handling this with great <laughs> suspicion. She's busty with her buns and just she's given us cake. I haven't had any yet. You must have some questions after all you've been through, so feel free to ask me anything and I'll answer to the best of my abilities. Who are you? Oh, I'm Andrea um, Sagath. I was Esme's master. And why, why have you come to us? You've had several run-ins with, I suppose, our followers so far. Not so much you little goblin but your friends earlier on they managed to wipe out pretty much all of our followers over at mutton castle your followers i had an organization we were trying to i suppose i could say prevent the end of the world if i remember correctly weren't they trying to encourage the spread of the corruption though yeah. So you're a narcissistic bitch. <laughs> it's a long story, so if you all want to hear it, I would get comfortable. I'll keep it short. Not as short as me, though, I'm a goblin. Very few things are as short as you, my dear. I take a swig of my pocket whiskey. Do any of you know of the Tree of Mana located far to the south? from here. Tree of what? The Tree of Mana. It's basically Yggdrasil. The Arcane University used it a lot. I, I, th I thought you, you know, said like Tree of Mana, like all manners of trees. Of mana, like magic. Yeah, okay. You, mana. You, mana. 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 There's no R in it. Yeah. No, but it, it, some people pronounce it that way because yeah. they're special. <laughs> I think I do. 
yes, both the druids will know there is a druids compound that's there. Um, pretty much the highest level druids in the world tend to go there because keeping this tree alive is essential for the entire natural order of the planet. The most stoned druids are there. The highest druids. Whoa, bro. Yes, every druid in their lifetime is meant to make a visit to that tree. That is correct, um, Frida. So, deep under the tree, there are some wells that allow people to see into the past, the present, and the future. And my sisters and I, we protect these wells. We're there to watch over the world, and that's kind of been our deal for many years. But we were looking into the future, and we saw something world-destroying come. I suppose you're familiar with the Ancient One, the one that Esme came to worship. It will eventually come here, and all who live here will die, except for a select few. What about orbs? Can they see through orbs? What do you mean? Oh, you mean the orb you took from, um, yes. Esme. I'll get to that. <laughs> Uh-oh. So, we couldn't agree on how to deal with this. This ancient cosmic entity was on its way here and we had to do something about it. One of them, my sisters, wished to fight it and has been amassing a force to stop it from ever reaching here. Another has decided to try and invest her time in guiding it elsewhere. So dissuading it, maybe making it go back to sleep. I'm not entirely sure what her plan is, but her goal is to stop it from coming here by distractions and persuasion. And I on the other hand, decided that the best way to deal with this was not to stop the entity from coming, but to be on its side, to enable its arrival so that it will spare myself and those who aid me. And then, once he has been and gone, he will leave eventually. I can use Therona's chronometer, and she gestures to this um, hourglass that you saw Esme had, and she now has on her, the one that has a small essence of the cosmos contained within instead of sand. It's quite beautiful, very mysterious. This artifact allows to the extent some manipulation of time, and by surviving the entity's arrival and seeing his departure, I can then use this to bring everyone back from the point of which they should have died. The world will be different, yes, but everyone will be pulled from the past into the future. Everyone will survive. It's not ideal, but you can't stop a creature like this. You can't stop an entity. You can't fight it. The best thing to do is to try and just survive it. That's just like your opinion, man. But that is what we have been trying to do. That's what we've been working towards. That's why Esme was trying to recruit Frida, and that is why I've been trying to recruit Alpheus. Because for part of the plan, we needed someone with nature magic. Obviously, we failed on both accounts. But Esme, my young apprentice, was sound of mind, and she supported the plan, but she wished to see what exactly it was we were fighting, because she knew that I had the orb, which I had created to observe its movements, to see how much time we had. And Esme stole the orb, and looked into the face of the thing that is coming, and it broke her. It destroyed much of her psyche, and drove her to madness. It's a good thing we didn't look into that orb then. No, 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 we, we did not look into any orbs. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder which will break first. Well... I tried to do the best I could by her to help her recover, to help keep her on as undestructive a path as possible, but in her state of mind she was irrational. She acted brashly, and Balam here kept hitting her in the face over and over and <laughs> over back at the castle, and she kind of got a grudge on you after. After that. Well, I'm glad that's dealt with. She is indeed dead, so she is indeed dealt with. So, basically, I'll try to make this short. You are mad. Secondly, you have not succeeded in any of what you have attempted, and you are talking about grand plans about doing this or that or surviving thing, and so far, if I'm a man to understand how destiny or fate works, you are not seemingly too destined to succeed further, because you've been thwarted by accidental wanderers. You are correct. Yeah. At this point in time, I have been defeated in every capacity, yeah. which is why I wish to speak with you today, to air everything out, 
and let you know that from this point on I will be leaving you alone and I will no longer be trying to bring about his arrival, at least for the time being. Could you not have sent that in a pigeon? Would you go to bank with that promise? I would not. She said for the time being, so I wouldn't bank that at all. Yeah. It's going to take many years to gather enough followers and the resources necessary to try this again. Just use prisoners. They've got nothing to live for. And by then, my sisters may have succeeded in their efforts, or perhaps you people will have changed the destiny of the world enough that it will all be moot. I did not foresee this group's arrival, so it is quite interesting. Um, why should you live like you've tried to do all this and try to manipulate fate? You don't have much of a say in the matter, my dear. You couldn't kill me. Okay, but I'm just asking why you should live. Kill her. I am pretty handy with a roof tile, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Very handy. We are on a roof. Well, why should anyone live? If you're going by that logic, then no one's lives matter, uh, does it? No, 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 no. That's circumventing the question, and it seems to like you're one of those high and mighty old ones. So you should know better to answer a question with a question. You should answer a question with truthfulness and, you know, your whole knowledge of the matter. I don't understand why you're asking such a question. Why should I live? Why should anyone live? Again, with the high and mighty, you should know. You should not live because you have been trying to manipulate or attract a great force easier into this world for your own benefit, it seems. And you say that by the guise of others' benefits, but it's not actually others' benefit if, that, if a really huge monstrosity gets true. All in all, it's not a positive situation. So what? You're saying I should just kill myself? No, I'm I'm saying that you should leave this world, maybe, if you are able to. Or at least leave us, because I'm going to throw the roof tile really soon. Well, I respect your opinion, and I've said my piece. I wanted you to know that from this point onwards, you will not be having any more problems with me or my followers. How do you know that the coming about this creature is not caused by your own actions? That you are fulfilling your own prophecy? Yeah, that's a good point. Oh, snap, got you silent, eh? Damn, she went there. The DM is currently thinking of a way to phrase it. The DM is not here right now. Please <laughs> leave a message after the tone. <laughs> Normal service hours are from 1 to 4 p.m. That's a very short service hour. Yeah. The, I already have a truth tile in hand. <laughs> okay, do you too? Could you stop interrupting me so I can actually no. speak? Oh, right. No, no. Go on. His coming has been foreseen regardless. What my efforts were to do would bring him about sooner. But it is inevitable whether I got involved or not. Okay, well... Tell us this then. Do you know a way of where, instead of bringing him about sooner, is there a way you'd be able to slow him down or stop it entirely? That is the work that my sisters are doing. Perhaps during your travels you may run into them, or perhaps they will flag you down. You have proven to be a extremely capable group, ones that I had not first seen coming. Speculation. Is she this giant evil entity and the subconscious is in her, but she needs to drag the body out of the world it isn't? And really, if we kill her, we've killed the thing. That would be brilliant. Brilliant. The vessel, the container. Yeah. Well, there's no way of really knowing that, is there? No, there isn't. That'll be pretty cool. Let's kill her. So, I've got this roof tile. And I have this bun. If there's any truth to what she's saying, it is not something that should be discussed with only a handful of people. It's something that the whole druidic community should discuss if it is something serious. Maybe the whole world. So, people can actually start... Well, I'm not saying call a witch hunt. But I'm just saying that if everyone knew what these cultists are like... Put it in the local paper. Well, mm. all I'm saying is that the head of the Druida community should really discuss this, find out if there's any truth to what she's saying, and if so, try and investigate. She'll stand up now, and she'll just smile and say, Well, you're free to do as you wish. I've said my piece. Goodbye. You're welcome to believe me or not believe me. You're welcome to act on it or not act on it. Preparing tile. Regardless, you know that I will no longer be a threat, and with any luck, we may never see each other again. So with that, I will respectfully bid farewell. Don't worry, you can continue to enjoy the tea and cakes. Yay! I offer her my hand. In marriage? No. That would be horrific. As you know, shaking hands. Why do you want to shake her hand? You've got a roof tile that's your 
ready to throw at her. I'm signalling that, okay, we can do this. If you leave, we won't harass you. She's going to make a sense motive check on you, my friend. <laughs> Is she? What should I roll then? Are you being genuine or are you lying? I'm not being 100% genuine. Regardless, I just rolled very badly. So yeah. she will give you a small smile and go, fair enough, and shake your hand. As she's trying to shake my hand, I assume she's got hair. She has hair, yes. I said she's got long black hair. I'm going to pluck out one single strand. Make a sleight of hand check. I will. (laughs) 26. Oh my Uh. god. Oh wow. (laughs) Just so you guys know, she rolled a natural one on Mm. sense motive. (laughs) So she believed that Balan was being completely genuine. And then she rolled a natural 20 on perception check. Mm. (laughs) Oh. So she is aware you just took her hair, yeah. but she's just going to smirk and just let go of your hand and walk off. I didn't give my hand, I just took her hair. What is up with you? Nothing. Oh, she just looks at you and divination magic. He's probably going to try scry on me later. It's all right. <laughs> He'll probably try and watch me in the bath or something. Well, you've been stalking us as well, so fair's fair. Yeah, I can't look at her without thinking of Mother Sagith all wrinkly and stuff. Yep. Or bacon. Or Yeah, or that. You're giving me images of that scene in Game of Thrones where the woman took off the necklace. Oh, God. Or, you know, um, Shining. Well, you lot won't know, but our listeners and our editor will. There's a scene at the end of the episode where Esme died that showed her using the timepiece to make herself young again. Hmm. The power of the artifact that she has on her. And with that, she is actually going to take the artifact, spin it round, and she vanishes. <laughs> she just gone somewhere in time. Anyway, I, I tie the piece of hair to like a nail or something and put it in my pocket. What was that all about? Amy asks. Uh, she is a creepy woman. Yeah, she is. What was her actual name? Andrea Sagath. Andrea Sagath. Okay. Okay, right. Catalogued. One strand of hair. <laughs> yeah, it now means scrying spells are like a hundred times easier. Yeah, because I don't really trust her, and I know about scrying a bit that witches and wizards do that. Yep. So, I'd slap my hands a bit. Should we have some tea? Well, you know, you guys should try these scones. They're <laughs> bloody great. Berkeley's just stuffing his face with um, scones. He's piled the clotted cream up really high. His dog Ooh. snout's covered in cream. Mr. Berkeley, do you put cream on first or do you put jam on first? Cream. That's a terrible argument to start. Heathen. You told that to my grandmother, she wouldn't shut up. Oh no. Well, I, I wouldn't eat those. They seem really suspicious. If Barlam's taught me anything, it's like anything from Sagith is horrible and <laughs> mistrustful. Exactly. <laughs> it's bloody delicious is what it is. I say to Alpheus that that's a good boy. Alpheus pants in happiness. I love that over the sessions there's been a slow conditional training of Alpheus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it started in like episode three. Slowly he's been conditioning Alpheus to just be obedient. Yeah, I'm conditioning my own actual real life dog at the same time when I'm conditioning Alpheus. So it's really <laughs> helpful. Like it's a mental exercise. Anyway, anyway, I offer Alpheus my actual own tea. Before we continue, Amy says, we should talk about what's going to happen when we close the rift. Yeah, what would happen? What do you mean? Well, the spell to close the rift will take me a good minute to cast. Like I've said before, I'm not a fully initiated rift warden yet. You made that clear. The fact that I can even do it at all is pretty good, but I'm not nearly as good as I wish I was. I look at him like a disappointed father. But if this is an open rift, there will probably be creatures from wherever this rift is in the area, which means that there's probably going to be a lot of pressure to try and stop me from casting the spell. There are a few things that we could do to speed the spell up. I could try and teach you all a part of it, so that way the more people we have casting the spell, the quicker it will go. And even if one of us gets interrupted, it won't end the spell. Alternatively, if I'm going to be the only one casting, we will need to keep them as far away from me as we can so that I can cast the spell and not be interrupted. I personally think that it 
would be best since everyone here, except for Uncle Barlam, has access to some kind of magic and Uncle Barlam has so shown such incredible aptitude towards magic, I think even he could be able to help us with this. I already cast a spell. You have, yes. I actually did cast a spell. Wow. Yeah, Berkeley just pats you on the back like, he did a fucking great job. Hey, bro. I slapped like a <laughs> predator like, hey, Dylan, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we better get a move on then and start looking. Would you all be willing to learn? If you gave me the time, I could teach you the basics of this spell, so that way, the more of you that we have casting the spell, the quicker it will go, and we have the option of not losing it. I like spells. How much time would that teaching take? Yeah. I could probably go through the basics of it, enough that you all can do enough of it. It will probably take me about an hour. The thing is that if we already saw or Madame Suspicious earlier. I'm not saying that she's horrible, but she's a bitch and she's horrible, so she might have let some traps which might be exploding any minute now. So... She said she wasn't going to harm us, though. Uh, I don't believe that. Do you also believe in fairies? <laughs> yes, because fairies do indeed exist. They are real. The Atomi are little shits. They'll stab you in the knees. <laughs> A, b- a better question would be, do you believe in guns, or do you believe in computers? Guns are just magic wands made out of metal. Shush you, you heretic. But anyway, it's not good to trust anyone. If you're going to be like a rift warden who's going to seal gates to other planes of existence, I think believing any odd woman or bloke is a bit dangerous. Odd woman? Don't you well, think? it's fair enough. I just brought this to you all because it's an option. I mean, if there are a lot of monsters down there, maybe we want to cast the spell faster than, you know, a minute. I do understand that, but the the way it's been phrased is that your teacher says this spell within an hour for it to be cast quicker, and it would kind of take longer. Well, not the entire spell, but... It would kind of take longer doing that anyway. Yes, but we don't have monsters trying to eat our faces. Monsters. The thing is, we need to be keeping the monsters off you. You don't have to. It sounds like none of you want to. No, it's so. not that I don't want well, to. It's t- I would be happy to help. It's just more of the fact that I'm worried that if we're all concentrating on trying to make the spell work, those things are going to come and get us and attack us whilst we're doing that. I figured it would be kind of more circumstantial, so if you kill a monster, find that you've got a couple seconds to spare, you could just add to the spell, you know? Oh, I guess that works. I think it's probably worth at least some of us knowing this some of the spell then. Spells! Woohoo! I think I'd be the slowest to learn, so... Berkeley's like, I don't mind either way. It's down to you lot. Here's a thought. What if I just go over the basics with Snork and Berkeley? As arcane casters it will translate over much quicker for them. Whilst you lot can look around on the second floor, I think the lab might have some useful bits and bobs down there. And those monsters seem to be trapped in the circles. You could just kill them without actually getting too close. What if attacking them sets them free? You could just ignore them. I mean, it's down to you. I'm just here to close a rift. Alphys then, I guess we'll look round the room but we won't touch the monsters unless they come at us. Sounds good. You can look, but you can't touch. I'll come too. Okay, so Frida, Alpheus, and Barlam will all head down to the second floor. Obviously, you can take with you Teapot and Snuffles, so that you lot can all look around there for anything worth taking. And Amy, still on the roof, she's going to help Snork and Berkeley at least get the fundamentals of the spell down. It is going to be a lot easier for you two, since you're both arcane casters. The druids could have learnt some of this, but it would have been more difficult for them. Snork, is there anything you want to talk about with Amy whilst you're training with Berkeley, even? Is there anything to do with fire? I like fire. Can I use my wand? You're a sorcerer, so you don't need an arcane focus. Yay! But the spell seems complicated, but you're able to get bits of it. You find that Berkeley's a really enthusiastic teacher. He picks it up very quickly, and then he's just like, when Whenever you get anything, even the slightest thing right, he praises you. <laughs> oh. Wasn't Mr. Pe- wasn't he like supposed to be head of conjuration before he was demoted to PE teacher or something? Yes. I'm sorry I destroyed <laughs> your place. 
days. Which is why he picks it up so quickly. So, you are looking around the laboratory. You find the bookshelves are full of various topics about the arcane, and in particular, planar study. On the desks, you see notes and notes about the study of a cosmic rift and alien monstrosities, and about the leakages of cosmic radiation, and notes upon possibly utilising such radiation to enhance creatures, as well as a wide range of speculated uses. These line up with the notes that Barlam found in the master bedroom, where he also found those random potions. So he did find notes with those potions, and I believe he pocketed all of those. But you see the experiments he did to get the potions refined to the point they are now. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of logs and reports about experiments that have been done on animals, and each failed experiment leads into another equally horrific experiment, until he built upon enough successes for the human experimentation phase of his studies, which, you know, led to the gibbering horror in the room above. Nice. So you don't know who this Elros is, but he definitely does not seem to be a good person. But you do manage to find a number of trinkets dotted around the lab that either he seems to have obtained legally or maybe illegally. Since I had you all roll last session, I will just tell you what you've managed to find. So the first item you found is a quiver. It is a magical quiver that is known as the efficient quiver. So it appears to be a typical arrow container capable of holding about 20 arrows. It has three distinct portions, each with non-dimensional support space, allowing it to store far more than it normally would be possible. The first and smallest of these can hold up to 60 objects of the same general size and shape as an arrow. The second, slightly larger component holds up to 18 objects of the same shape and size as a javelin. And the third and longest portion can contain as many as six objects of the same and general size of a bow. This includes staffs, spears, things like that. Once the owner has filled it, the quiver can quickly produce any item that they wish that is within the quiver, as just as if it were a regular quiver or scabbard. It will always weigh two pounds no matter what you place inside of it. Frida, look at this. It's fun. <laughs> can the thing, does the thing have to fit inside the quiver? Yes. Whatever you put in there has to be either roughly the same shape and size of an arrow, a javelin, or a bow. Right, you did say that, and I was listening right now. <laughs> Like, yeah. you can put, like, different sized poles and, you know, yep. it's a wood. It doesn't have to be just bows. You can carry firewood in there. It has to be stick-shaped. Yeah, sticks. Could I put my wand in there? Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's clearly been designed for a Frida. Let's give it to Frida, then. <laughs> So, Frida, <laughs> you've got this item which allows you to put your quarter staff, your bow, and your arrows in without them weighing anything. Oh, wow, that's useful. Could I fit in it? No. Oh. Are you about as thin as a bow? I can stand there and put my hands in the air and go, like, stiff as a board. It's a snork backpack. <laughs> it's a snork pack. Snork pack. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. So, the next thing you find is a sticky henna paste and able to identify as the Beast Bond brand. You use it to stamp a rust-coloured handprint onto the body of a familiar or animal companion and a hoof claw paw print from that creature onto its master. The brand demonstrates a bond of friendship and balance, not ownership or subservience. Applying the band is a full round action for both the master and the companion, and the brand enhances the ability to share spells between the two, allowing the characters to cast their spells with a range of personal or touch on the marked companion at a range of 30 feet. Can we use the henna paste bit when me and Alafia? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid not. Say you had Snuffles leap onto your enemy and start biting them, you could then use your turn to deliver a spell through Snuffles onto the enemy, so you don't even need to get close. Sounds good. Who wants to take that? Eh. Frida? It's a tattoo thing which you can strengthen your bond with your animal. I guess it's something that me and Alpheus will share. Yeah, there are ten uses of it. Oh, I thought it was just like a one sticker thing. 
You put a sticker and say, I own that. The next thing you find is a page of spell knowledge, which contains a level one spell on it that a wizard would be able to use to gain access to said spell, or a sorcerer could use to just cast that spell as if it were a scroll. So it's just a scroll? It doesn't run out like a scroll though, so it's like an infinite scroll. Oh, you can cast it once per day or something. If the bearer is a spontaneous spellcaster and has the spell on their class spell list, you may use your spell slots. So you can use your own spell slots to cast that spell. Oh, without knowing it or using your spell knowledge slots, yeah? Without knowing it, so that's why it doesn't run out. What about wizards? Wizards can learn it, add it to their spell book. So for me, it would just be a scroll. In fact, we should probably figure out what spell's on it. Rolling? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Because it might actually be relevant for the fight ahead. Rolling, 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 rolling. Snork, can you roll me a d100, please? Eleven. <laughs> Eleven. And now, Barlam, can you roll me a d100 as well, please? I can. That's a six. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. We're doing well. Low bros. As in, you know, low bro and, and low brothers. Land of brothers. So this is a spell of cause fear. Call fear. Cause fear. Cause, <laughs> cause, yeah. So it scares someone. One creature of five hit dice or less flees for 1d4 rounds. So any level five or lower creature would run away. If they fail the save. If they fail the save. It's a necromantic spell. Oddly Ooh. fitting given that this guy's a bit of a creep. Necromantic. Is it like shouting Oogala Boogala Boogala Boogala? I guess so. <laughs> yeah, I like that spell then. Oogala Boogala. Oh no, don't man. Okay, the last thing you find is a volatile vaporizer, level 2. Whoa. It sounds like a sci fi weapon. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? What it can do is you put it into a potion, and in this case, because it's a level 2 vaporizer, it needs to be put into a level 2 potion. And it will then bubble up and release a 10 foot radius cloud affecting all all creatures within that radius with the effect of that potion. So say you used it on a potion of cure moderate wounds, instead of one person drinking it, all creatures within a 10 foot radius will gain benefit of that cure moderate wounds. It can only be used once however. I don't understand. Say again? Praise the glow cloud. I love it because if you put it in like a whole bottle of vodka. <laughs> everyone within 10 foot will get drunk. <laughs> yeah, everyone would get smashed drunk like instant drinking a whole bottle of vodka. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Yeah, that's good. So, basically, if we want to distract a huge amount of guards, we'd throw Elpheus to the wolves by making him down vodka with this thing. Maybe. It's a one-time use item that essentially allows you to turn any level 2 potion, instead of only using it for one person, you could use it to affect like a dozen people, basically. Would that affect us, though, as well? Yes. If it's an aggressive one, then you'll um, you use it aggressively. If it's a good one, then you'll use it to benefit all of you. Yeah. First it puts on the lotion, then it makes a notion to use the potion next time. I would love to have that potion. You can let Balam have it if you want. Volatile vaporizer. Can I have it, people? Uh, well, considering Frida has something, I have something right now. Here. It's kind of a team item. I'll take the volatile vaporizer. <laughs> Actually sounds like a vaping machine. <laughs> They're trying to get you off the cigarettes. Yeah, yeah. They didn't want to tell you, so they just kind of like, oh look, here's this vaping kit. <laughs> Do we know anyone who smokes? Barlam, you can use this. Hint, hint. Oh no. As Alpheus hands it over, he just says, looking into Barlam's eyes, smoking kills. <laughs> and I tell him, sit down. <laughs> Alpheus sits down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think we know who's the master here, and I light up a smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Defeats at the dog again. <laughs> so, you finish looting the place just at the same time that Amy, Snork and Berkeley come down. Snork and Berkeley have learnt the spell enough to be able to help slow down, uh, speed up the casting process. <laughs> slow, slow down, down the casting. <laughs> be counterintuitive, but we, we learnt something. But not enough to sustain the spell by themselves. So, if Amy gets hit and fails her concentration check, you'll lose the spell and start over. But, for every round that Snork or Berkeley chooses to help her with the spell it reduces the casting time by one round how much is the casting time in round 10 rounds because it's one minute okay she, didn't say a, she said a minute yeah that's 10 rounds oh is it really bloody hell because one round is six seconds so it's 10 rounds and snork and berkeley have the ability to help drop that by an extra round like every round they do it yes so minimum casting time is four rounds actually yes 
Berkeley remembers that there was a lever on the top of the roof and being the kind of person he is he basically breaks the cage and pulls the lever there you go you hear the sound of movement on the ground floor oh oh great let's start chanting the spell you do know from the notes that the rift is in the basement Oh. That sounds like a happy noise. Why don't we ready ourselves? Yeah. Because it looks like Alpheus and Snuffles are injured. Yes. So does anyone want to heal them up? I would like to cure light wounds on... um... Snuffles? Yes. Roll 1d8 plus 4. You go to level 4. 6. Yeah, there was much rejoicing. Okay, that's brought him to about half health. You guys do have healing potions on you. Yeah, but I'd love to save my only one for myself. Sorry. (laughs) Alpheus, are you wanting to use any healing spells or potions? I don't have any healing spells. I'm just checking my uh, items. I'm definitely going to use a healing potion. What kinds of droids are you? The non-healing ones. Alpheus is not specced for that, though. It's more the attacking type. Uh... You're using a potion as well. Yes. Okay, what did I say potions normally count as... D8 plus 3. 1D8 plus 3. Nice. Delicious healing. You are nearly on full health now, so you're pretty much good to go. We'll roll with that then, I guess. You are ready to head down to the basement. You go back to the ground floor, and that hatch that you found at the bottom left corner has now unlocked and opened, and you are able to see a ladder that leads down into (coughs) the room below. Let's go there. I'll check for traps and go down first. Ladder, 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 ladder. Ladder? How are dogs with ladders, though? Uh, And lions. Pretty bad. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna be half carrying a lion down a flight of. Um, are, you, are you sure it's like ladder. 500 pounds or 400 maybe? You're talking to the person that has to sleep in bed with this lioness trying to creep up and cuddle up to them at night. Joe, your strength is like seven. <laughs> I'll carry the lion <laughs> with my strength of seven. <laughs> and all her bones are broken. Um, you want Alpheus. He's the buff boy here. Buff boy. Alpheus, could you give me a hand lifting teapot down the ladder? Berkeley's like, and I'll help Snuffles. This is why you need a levitating chair. Yeah, animal levitating. Or like a small lift. If only someone had floating discs. Yeah, we could, we, we could make like a folding boat, but make it into an animal lift. <laughs> An animal winch. Yeah, there's a transformer sound. Oh, 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 oh. Snuffles is super confused when Berkeley just strolls over and picks him up and just like cradles him. Alpheus does his best to handle Teapot then. Is it like Goofy and Pluto? Yes. It's Alpheus time. Yeah, Teapot starts licking Alpheus's hair. Uh, uh, no, I don't want to shower. Uh. Uh, cat, cat bacteria. No, uh. Cacteria. Alphys, uh, uh, I, I guess uh, Alphys would pull up his hood to, to try and prevent it as much as possible. Or you lick her back because that's the only solution. So, Barlam will start descending down the ladder. You don't see any traps at this time. Ooh, not even a roll. No, it's fine. You descend down. It is a very long flight of stairs as you go through kind of a long dark tunnel for a little while until you reach a room that opens up. It is quite vast in size. It is circular and the walls are covered in spikes like spears pointing inwards. In the centre of the room there is a large tear in reality that has a demonic looking hellscape on the other side. The rift is surrounded by some kind of cage and it's chained to the ceiling, the walls and the floor. Underneath it there is a ring of lava and a couple of bridges to allow you to get up close. Around the room you see a number of eldritch monstrosities. There is some kind of bleeding. There is a worm-like creature that has rows of caterpillar legs on its underside that's walking along one of the walls. Four long pseudopods are emerge from beneath its fang-lined maw in its bulbous head and they drip with some sort of venom. Oh, it's a carrion crawler. Not quite, but close. Oh. You see a creature that has three downward curving petals of flesh with dark pebbly outer hide and a pallid whisting underside. The petals end with a split tip and the coverage at the centre. On its underside at the centre dangle a swarm of writhing pallid tentacles, 16 manipulator arms and 8 thin 
inner tendrils with red eyes at the end. Death flower. At the centre of these tentacles is a sphincter-shaped mouth at the end of its flexible trunk, one foot long and six inches at diameter, and this thing is hanging from the ceiling. Kill it with fire! You see also a man-sized flying jellyfish with 12 long tendrils and four thin eye stalks that protrude from its cap. The cap is a blackish grey and the eye stalks are a dark grey. Sounds like the thing's out of Mass Effect. I just got my mouth covered in horror. And finally there is a creature that's flying around that appears to be leech-like in shape but it is as big as a person and it seems to be made up of nothing but dozens and dozens of mouths just wide open and shrieking in agony as it just flies around and I will now show you all the map of the area. I look over my shoulder to the other compatriots and say I think the rent for this place is a bit high like this flat is a bit infested yeah I wouldn't even pay anything to live here yeah it's like 60 pounds a week nah 60 pound a week's not terrible it's not terrible but you need to do renovations and you know mm, so it end up costing you more yeah exactly so Barlam you are climbing down the ladder they have yet to notice you because they aren't expecting anyone I don't know what's more awful what are you going to do I don't even know where to start Just wait a second Barlam's the one leading the charge down the ladder. So. Yeah, exactly. So is Barlam the only one that can see anything at this point in time then? What's your climbing order? So Barlam goes down first. Who goes down next? Oh, Alpheus. Yes. Come on. Come on, doggo. Come on. Alpheus carrying Teapot come next. Who's after that? Um, me. Frida. And then Berkeley will come carrying Snuffles. So Snork can come next with Beaker. And Amy will come down. Rather than carrying her Eidolon, she's going to be carried by it. She's going to ride the Eidolon down. Is the chicken named after a sippy cup? Yes. <laughs> it's named after a Sesame Street character. I think it's named after a Muppet. Oh, what a Muppet. Barlam, as I said, you're the first one down to see all this. What do you do? I take my boat and I should have something which is close enough for me to sneak attack. They're all pretty much close enough. Okay. The one in the middle is on the ceiling, so since you're still on the ladder, that one is technically closest. Okay, but I'll shoot at the flying lamprey, lamprey or whatever. Okay, that would be the one that's made up of shrieking mouths. Exactly. So the rest of you notice Barlam pull out his bow and take a shot. So there's yeah. something going on. Okay, where's my spell list? That's 23 for attack. That's a hit. Roll for sneak attack. And sneak is 2d6, actually. Oh, no, it's not. Am I, am I third level? You are, yes. You're fourth level. Oh, okay, right. Then it's 2d6. Bam. That's seven. Ten damage total with a silver arrow. So a silver arrow flies from your location and strikes this mass of mouths deep through one of the mouths and into its body. They let out a more pain shriek this time and it now turns round to see you. So oh. with that, everyone roll me initiative checks. Yay. Here we go. That's an eight. I rolled a one. I rolled a ten. Wow. Peter rolled a four. <laughs> Plus five. I got nine. We might become blee things. And the idea for my next campaign... <laughs> Band of blee things. Oh, <laughs> oh, like you know, um, one of those art artwork animation. You know, the um sheep thing. Sean the sheep. Where bunny? No, yeah. Oh, uh, Wallace and Gromit. Yeah, Wallace and Gromit style. They did the spin off Sean the sheep and Timmy time as well. Yeah, Sean the sheep. Yeah, let's play that. Band of blee things. No, they're blee things. Ba 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 ba. Oh dear, people are not getting good initiative rolls today. Yep, yep. So was that Berkeley got two? And he's got four. Now for the monsters. Can we roll again? <laughs> I hope you're prepared for your first TPK. Again, what kind of characters would you like to do for a Dark Sun campaign? What's that? Fallout, Fallout, Mad Max and D&D mixed up. Ooh, the flaming psycho. Oh yeah, that's, that's normal. <laughs> I see a pattern happening. Can I be like a western wandering person who's like a scavenger? Yeah, you can, but will you also be a desert psycho? <laughs> are we all desert psychos? You are, but like it's the same as choosing a race in D&D, like human, human, half elf. The other one's a bit more psycho, the other one's a little less psycho. <laughs> oh yeah, in Darkson there's a lot of psionics, like psychic powers. 
Talk it's one of, of my future, favorite yeah. settings. Okay, so Balam took your shot, so I'm gonna let you continue because this was a surprise round. You still have your move action. He pushes everyone back up the ladder and <laughs> <laughs> with his strength. Is everyone back up the ladder? I believe everyone's on their way down. Yeah. Okay. I didn't tell you I was. I'm still at the very top of the tower. <laughs> oh, sorry. Is it a ladder or a staircase? Ladder. It's a ladder. Okay, shit. Because if it would have been a staircase, I would have just run over them back up. I'll just move as far as possible from each one of the monsters if I can okay well let me just move everyone else because they're not actually on <coughs> the area yet. so you move your character you should see the map oh sorry actually is that like a brazier it is yes I'll run behind it and try to hide because maybe the others haven't seen me yet <laughs> that one just screeched and definitely going to look over but the others will have looked to what was screeching first so you can make a hide and see if you can at least avoid three of them that's 24 holy cow I cannot roll low because I am from Finland. I guess I'll roll stealth as well. They all get to go before the rest of you, so let's see. The one on the ceiling sees you, since it's hanging on the ceiling. Oh, uh, plus 15. Chimney cricket. It's basically got a shit ton of eyes. Remember I said that it's got, like, beholder eye stalks? Oh, no. Oh, my God. So I'm afraid they've all seen you. They've all seen Barlam. Yeah. Well. All? All of them. One of them got a bloody 20. They're all uh. staring at you. Oh, well. Just kill me then. <laughs> Come on. Do your best. Do your worst. I, I regret that. Do your second worst. Don't do your actual worst. Combat begins, and the one on the ceiling, that mass of, you know, fleshy stalks and everything, that is going to slowly s- slide across the ceiling. I'll wait patiently. In fact, he's going to go to the ladder and wait, because you're on the floor, and the ceiling is very high up. So he can't really reach you. So he's going to go to the ladder and try to get whoever's coming next. The one that you shot is up next and it's going to fly straight towards you. Hello. So what is your AC? 15. Oh, so this one flies down. It's got many, many, many mouths. But as it makes a fly straight towards you, you have managed to duck down behind the brazier and it has to dodge at the last second because one of the spears coming out of the wall, well, it's about to fly into it. So it has to dodge to avoid that and it will then spin around and pretty much float where it is it was unable to hit you which means next up is the jellyfish looking one who is going to fly down and try to attack you do they get a charge bonus or something he's not charging Mm. he does hit well, only with one of his tentacles. Right. And you take four points of damage Ow. as one of its tentacles swings down and strikes you. Could you please make me a fortitude save, please? That's 17. Okay. This strikes you and you can smell the poison just secreting <clears throat> from its tentacles. <clears throat> but you dry heave a bit and you manage to strengthen your resolve and avoid taking any poison from that. Nope. The last one, the slime crawler, he might not actually be able to reach you this turn. So that slime crawler is going to skittle along the floor, moving towards you, ready to join his friends in on the fun. Alpheus, you're up next. You just saw Balam take a shot and then pretty much jump down the ladder and run. Now did I though? I assumed you're all coming down the ladder, so... You have not fully descended yet. That's a testicle joke. Right, okay, so I've already passed that creature, or am I not then? Well, you're about to go down, so... So I haven't seen it then? You haven't seen it yet. So I didn't see what Barlam did then? Remember, when you first went down, I said it's kind of like a shaft. So it's a dark shaft that you go down, and then you see the light, and it opens up into an actual full room. So you're still in the shaft, but you can see below you what Barlam did, and then he ran off. You don't see where he is now. So when you come out of the shaft, then you get attacked by the other thing. Okay, so let's do that then. Okay, so that's going to attack you. And what is your armor class? My AC 17. Okay, so it does manage to hit, and you take five points of damage from it. Schnicky, schnicky. (laughs) So as you climb down the ladder, this horrible mess of limbs and appendages strike against you. It takes the wind out of you for a minute, but you're able to keep going until you get down to the bottom. So you and 
and Teapot are now there. Mm. You can see Barlam hiding behind Abrosia, surrounded by monsters. Also, carrying a lion down ladder yep. would be like a strongman competition thing. Yep, he's got it under one arm. So, Alpheus, what do you do? So, Alpheus is going to try and take out the... Teapot. <laughs> yeah, take out Teapot into love and take out the eyeball creature, if possible. The eyeball one. The one that's on the ceiling. Okay, how will you attack it? None of my spells are useful, so I'm going to use a, a long-range thing, I guess. Snowball. I don't have snowball with me today. <gasps> I do, however, have a sling and a dagger. Okay. Chuck rocks at it. Sling. You guys have level two spells now. What level two spells did you get? Flaming Sphere. I've already used it. Ah, okay. In fact, I only have one spell left. Ah. I don't have level two spells. No, you should have because you're fourth level sorcerer. That is a hit. The sling shoots up as you throw a little bullet rock into it and it starts squirming and rhyming all around as it like bounces off of it but it starts oozing blood from its wound take that ha also since snuffles is up with frida i will allow you to command teapot this round ah okay i don't really know teapot's strengths because i don't have teapot's character sheet snuffles's thing is basically tripping his enemies teapot's thing is grappling her enemies okay let's try and get teapot to grapple that one right next to her if possible because of where you've dropped her, she can basically make a full round attack. Yeah, okay. That will enable her to use her rend ability, which lets her grapple on a successful claw attack. Let's do that then to the one right next to Teapot. So she gets a bite attack and two claw attacks. So roll me 3d20, please. Whoop, 15, 7, and 10. Okay, and her modifier is plus 4 on those. So only her bite manages to hit. She's unable to grapple it at this time, so... Roll me a d6, please. D6. Three. So she manages to take a good bite out of the slime crawler. It doesn't bleed red blood like you'd expect, but a green ooze slimes out of it a bit. Yeah. Another dry heave. Can I still move on my turn? You can move, but Teapot can't because she had to use her entire round attacking. Sure, I just want to make room for others to come down. Also, pretty much all the enemies next to Barlam are in the air, so you can go underneath them. Oh, are they? Oh. The only enemy on the floor right now is the Slime Crawler, which Teapot is now applying pressure to. Okay, I would like to move over to the other side of this room in that case, if possible. So, kind of near Barlam, but on the other side. Well, you'll be able to give him some flank so that will help him out. Okay. So, Snork, you're up. What can I see below me? You can see Frida and Berkeley. I wait my turn till they're down the ladder. Okay, so you'll have to hold your turn until basically the end of the round because Berkeley's the slowest one. Okay, Barlam, you're up. Alpheus has just come rushing to help. Can I move here with a five foot step? Yep. Whoop. And then flanking, attacking the thing. Okay, go for it. Uh, is it melee? Melee. Both are acceptable if you're asking for pronunciation, but yeah, you can roll your sword attack. No, no, but I meant that. Is it in melee range or? Yes, it is. Okay, I'll roll a sword attack. Sure, it's third. There it's a 11 plus flanking or minus dex or whatever. It's plus flanking. It's not taken flat footed, but you are getting the flanking bonus. Mm-hmm. And that is a miss. Okay, I'm done. You all leveled up, so you do all have your hero points back. I don't think I was here for the level. How many points do I have? One hero point. I believe so. I'll re roll that then if I can. Rather than re roll it, you could just add plus four to it and you probably will. Right, I'll use that. Okay, so you use your hero point, which will bring you from. From a 13 to 17 and that is a hit 5 damage plus the sneak attack that's 11 just checking it has no damage resistance <laughs> real quick mm. so that would be bad if it did Okay, we're good. No, oh, 16 damage. Nice. So as it was thrashing at you, it got distracted by Alpheus suddenly running up behind it because this thing doesn't have eyes. It's just like a mass of mouths. So however it's sensing movement, you have no idea. But it was distracted for a moment, allowing you to get a good deep blow with your sword huh. as you run a good long cut along its body, drawing a considerable amount of blood from it. So it's not dead yet. It's not dead yet, but it is is definitely hurting. Okay. Frida, you're up next and you are the next one down the ladder so you can get down. Okay, let's think. I have two spells left, right? Or yep. yep. As you scuttle down, you see this um, monstrosity on the ceiling hanging around by the ladder. It doesn't attack you though because it used its attack of opportunity on Alpheus. So I'm not anywhere near anyone else. You are right next to Teapot. 
Okay, what did she attack? That green she thing? Attacked, she attacked this slime crawler that's next to her. All the other enemies besides the crawler are up in the air. Okay, so I have two spells left, right? I assume so. Okay, I'd like to use ball strength. Ooh. Okay, on teapot. Uh, no, myself. <laughs> on yourself? Yeah. Why? So that it increases my strength score for attacks. You normally attack with a bow. Guess it doesn't matter then. I mean, no, you can. Don't let me stop you, but I'm just asking because you are much better equipped with archery. And since most enemies are flying, it means you can actually avoid damage and still help your teammates. And you can just shoot this turn. You did take precise shot with your level up, so you won't hit your allies. I guess I'll go for the bow then. You can cast ball strength on Teapot though. That will definitely help her out. I'm going to save it. Yeah, I'll go with them there and go after what teapot's attacking. Okay, where are you going to position yourself on the map? Because you can pretty much move most of the area. You did have to use some of your movement climbing. Um, right now, standing next to teapot. Okay, so you're going to make a shot at the crawler. Go right ahead. Um, was it a uh, d20? Yep. What did you get? A 10. Your bow modifier is a plus five, so that is a miss. You shoot the arrow at the slime crawler, but it just kind of gets stuck into its kind of slimy, messy body and just kind of dissolves. Well, that's your turn because Teapot's already acted. You'll get control of her next turn. Amy is next. She's at the back of the queue, so she'll hold her turn, which means Berkeley's up and he's going to run down. He gets to the bottom, sees the situation unfolding. He's like, oh, this is fucked up. And he's going to grab Snuffles and he's going to throw him. Oh, no. Because he's holding Snuffles already. He's going to make a ranged attack roll with Snuffles. Snuffles cannon. <laughs> <laughs> That's the wizard like. He's a buff boy. I'm gonna be him when I grow up. Buff boy. Buff boy. Base stack bonus is three. Yes, so a strength bonus of three. So that is D20 plus six. Oh no! Yes. Uh, oh. Ooh. <laughs> Why do bad things always happen to Snuffles? Who is he throwing it towards? He was gonna throw it at one of the flying enemies. Is it gonna hit a friend now? So basically, the dog's curled in midair in a <laughs> moment. <laughs> So he picks up Snuffles, holds him up like a rugby ball or an American football, ready to throw it, and Snuffles just freaks out and starts squirming and thrashing, kicks Berkeley in the face, and Berkeley falls to the floor as Snuffles falls to the floor, and then Snuffles just runs off, and Berkeley is prone and will take three points of damage. The fool! Does Snuffles still get a turn, though? <laughs> Snuffles still gets a turn, so Snuffles is going to run over to where you are. <laughs> the enemies are in the air, so he's going to be able to slip through. Nice. And actually, Snuffles is acting independently this round. No one's giving him orders. He's just trying to get back to his boss. Rather than this weird gentleman that threw him. Berkeley! But in all fairness, Berkeley was going to throw him at a flying enemy, so it would tackle him to the ground. It was a clever idea. It was a clever idea, but execution Mm. Oh well, maybe he'll get a next chance. But I still believe in Berkeley because he didn't throw me. <laughs> no. I get the impression he would have thrown any of us if any of us were next to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's fair. <laughs> Snuffles got on that one as well. So Snuffles runs over and starts snapping at this giant mass of mouths. But then he's just like, Err? because when you see a dog trying to bite another dog that's trying to bite him and they're just trying to get their mouths around each other's mouths yeah. and it's just awkward because neither of them's biting each other but they're both trying to, that's kind of what's happening. Yeah. So Berkeley and Snuffles wasted their turn, which now means Snork, you can go. What's below me? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, You're going to go down the ladder and you'll be on the floor. I'm going to assume Beaker's with you. Can I see anything right below me below the ladder? No, no one is directly under the ladder. Oh, fab. Okay. Everyone was smart enough to at least clear the space directly under the ladder. So, yeah, you can get to the floor or you can hang on to the ladder and shoot from there, but you're going to be an easier target and in Amy's mm, way. I'm on the floor. Okay. Do I have a level two spell? Probably. You didn't use any of your spells in the last game, so... I don't even know how what, what my level two spell is because I don't think I leveled it because I wasn't around. Oh, you're right. Bloody hell. So I use magic missile and I shoot something, I don't know. Can I grease up my magic missile so it makes it... No, I can't. <laughs> I didn't no. just say that. Uh, <laughs> no, that's a stretch. No. 
it's tired and I'm early. Um, <laughs> oh um, you can cast magic missile if you'd like, and you'll be guaranteed to hit any of the enemies. Yeah, I'm going to cast magic missile. Okay, magic missile is a guaranteed hit. I just need to know now that you're level four, how many missiles two do you missiles. shoot? I think you fired two at this day. One per odd level. For every two levels beyond first, so that's one, three, five, seven, nine. So which target are you shooting at? How many? You fire two missiles. They'll do 1d4 plus 1 damage. Per missile. Which one's already been hit? The one next to Barlam is the weakest one right now. I'll fire double Z's that way. Okay, roll 2d8 plus 2. Do it like Skeletor. 2d8? Yeah, 2d4 plus 2. 2d4, 2d4. Okay, I was going to say. Some damn powerful magic missiles if it were. <laughs> oh, you fucking joking. I did 4 damage altogether. Wow. wow. Snake eyes. ba da bam Two missiles shoot past from Snork and strike into that flying creature. It doesn't do a massive amount of damage, but considering it's already weak, it's definitely noticeable. It's slightly weak. Uh. Yes. Can I move out the way now? Yes, you still have a part of your movement action left. I move to above the dog, Doge. You can you can go home, please. You are excused. Goblin time. Goblin time. I move above. The smallest magic missiles. Pew pew. Okay, so you do have access to second level spells now. You cast three of them a day and you know one spell. So I'm going to drop you the spell list. Wait, wait, how do I choose? You pick one spell and you can use it three times a day. Wow. Wow. Sorcerers know very few spells, but they get a lot of castings of it. So Snork, where are you going to put yourself? Above the Doberman. So your turn is done, which means Amy, who was holding her turn, goes. She flies down on her owl. She's just going to get to the first furthest side so she jumps off runs to the other side and the owl's gonna come and try to help you guys out i guess it's going to attack the big mess on the ceiling because it can fly yeah so because the owl has spent most of its turn moving he gets only one attack this turn so it's gonna use one of its talons it manages to draw some blood from it. It's not a massive amount of damage, but, you know, it's flapping around and scratching and clawing and pecking, so that's going to keep it busy at least. And Amy gets herself ready and starts casting the spell. So we are now going to count that one turn of the spell has been done. So nine more turns to go. Up next is the one on the ceiling, who is going to attack the owl, since the owl's attacking it. It gets six tentacle attacks. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, four attacks hit. Thank goodness for bad dice rolls. So the owl gets hit repeatedly by the monster on the ceiling. It takes quite a beating, but it's still up for the good fight. For the good, good fight. Oh, and it gets an attempt to grapple, I think. So the owl has been grabbed by the tentacles that hit it and is being pulled into the mess. It's flapping and squawking, but it's keeping it busy. So <laughs> at least there's that. The one that's surrounded by everyone being attacked is in a bit of a shitty situation right now. I want Molten Orb. Molten Orb. That sounds amazing. I just like the look of it. Uh, I'm still looking, but I don't know if it'll be. Molten Orb. It's basically a weaker fireball which causes burn damage as well. So it's good. Nice. I approve. This is horrible. There's something called Blood Blaze. Blood Blaze. I'm sorry, carry on. Okay, so the one that's basically just a giant mass of mouths makes a bite attack against all three of the enemies surrounding it and doesn't successfully hit any of them. Wonderful. Chomp, chomp, chomp. You see as it thrashes and one of the mouths on its tail tries to bite Alpheus but gets protected by a shield. Its torso then swings and tries to bite Snuffles but just gets caught by Snuffles' mouth as they continue to do that <laughs> awkward dog thing. And then the face tries to bite Barlam who is very much aware of its movements and just manages to deftly dodge it. And also immune to mouths. So next up is the kind of jellyfish one who is next to Snuffles. What can he do? The jellyfish thing tries to bite and tentacle attack Snuffles, and both attacks will hit. Oh no. Snuffles takes a sizable amount of damage from this bite as he yelps out in pain. What a surprise. And the thing tries to grab him as well. And I think that fails. I think his CMD is pretty good. Yep. He doesn't grab Snuffles. Snuffles is quite worse for wear. He's on six hit points. Snuffles actually stopped being grabbed or grappled by something. It is a miracle. <laughs> it's a Christmas miracle. <laughs> if it's a cat, it's a Christmas miracle. So the slime crawler that is being attacked by Teapot is going to 
spin round now and it opens its mouth wide as it spews a fetid sludge all over Teapot, Frida and Snork who are in a line. This is what the old woman wanted to bring into the world, so mm. no thanks. All three of you, please roll a fortitude save. Yeah. Is it a 20? It's d20 plus your fortitude. Oh, that's a 20. Boo, 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 boo. Okay, and roll one for Teapot as well. No, it's four. Four plus one. I got 15 altogether. Joe, I need you to roll another one, please. Another 20. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wasting your crits. Does she win the game? Does everyone blow up? And the God of Chaos blows up and we win. That's really funny. I rolled two nat 20s. Oh, my map's broken. Oh. Uh, Even Snork managed to avoid the poison damage from that. Woohoo! So, for this turn at least, you are all safe. Which means, Alpheus, you are up next. Sure thing. Got a question. If I leave that particular area with that creature that I'm flanking of Barlam right now, does that thing get an attack of opportunity against me because it's on the ceiling? You don't know whether or not it's got combat reflexes, so you don't know if it gets multiple attacks of opportunity or not. But if you do try to move away from it, it will get an attack of opportunity unless all you do is a five foot step. So basically the answer is yes. Okay, that's fine. So I'm going to do a five foot step. Okay. And I'm going to do something I haven't done before. And that's I'm going to get rid of my level one spell and I'm going to transfer it out for Summon Nature's Ally. Ooh, okay. What are you summoning? You've activated my trap card. Uh-huh. And I'm going to summon a giant centipede. Oh, oh. more crawlies. <laughs> I thought it was appropriate. Like, are you one of them? No. One of us. One of us. Office is like, mm, centipede, come to me. Sen- centipede. Okay, so summon nature's ally, giant centipede. It is a medium-sized creature, so ooh, that's pretty scary. Well, it's not a small centipede now, is it? It's giant. Look, the other options were pony or dolphin, and, you know, they weren't appropriate. What What do you mean, pony or dolphin? Why did you not spawn the dolphin in a deep dungeon cave? <laughs> lava uh, dolphin. Dungeon. There are others oh, as well. Do you think it could swim in lava? I'm just going to use this mutant token to cover the centipede for now, so you know where it is. Sure. Where did you want to put the centipede? Basically below Alpheus. Okay. Yeah. So what will Snuffles do? He is very low on health now. So Snuffles was going to do... Uh, five foot step and Snuffles was going to attack the creature okay make a bite attack Snuffles use your biting fangs (laughs) Snuffles biting fangs yeah Ooh, nice okay and roll a combat maneuver bonus actually it's flying you can't trip flying enemies well you need to ground it first you're not allowed out this week no i'll tell you what roll a combat maneuver bonus to see if you can bring it to the floor i threw it on the ground you can't make it prone but you can at least make it easier to reach d23 okay it doesn't matter so snuffles leaps up bites the thing manages to draw a good amount of blood as this thing is like falling apart at the seams now and <laughs> question if you make a flying creature prone they fall yes so you can make them prone he didn't succeed though uh, well you, you just said that you can't make them prone but, um i'm not entirely sure but anyway this centipede's turn so he gets a bite attack so roll a d20 add two i think that's the only thing the centipede can do Eight. <laughs> that's a surprising hit Centipede Go Centipede Centipede My army of followers So roll a d6 Minus one One No. Oh. Okay Is this thing Immune to poison or not? Most likely will be No he isn't Awesome He has to make a fortitude save Against your centipede poison <laughs> Where he takes dexterity damage mm-hmm. <laughs> Centipedes can be very poisonous Who takes dexterity damage? It's a 12. Oh my god. DC's 13. Okay, next round it's going to take dexterity damage. Awesome. Good work, PD. Hey. Making him easier to hit. Oh, PD. <laughs> Snork, you're up. Did you pick a spell? Oh my god. Do I want fire sneeze or fire breath? <laughs> <laughs> I think fire sneeze. Here's the description. See if you can tell which one's which. Exhale a cone of flame at will, or launch flaming, forceful phlegm at your enemies. <laughs> that sounds good. Oh, it's n- knocking prone as well, but the blast associated with the sneeze. I might take the flame. I think the sneeze is thematically correct for a goblin. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I'm, I'm gonna go for fire sneeze. I can use that three times a day. I'm very bunged up. That's. <laughs> 
We've got the eternal sniffles. Snuffle sniffles. You may use that right now if you like. Hell yeah. What is the spell called? It is called Fire Sneeze. Fire Sneeze. Reflex health and it will deal 2d6. Yeah, I'm looking to see whether it's like a range of cone or what. Oh, it's 10 foot long cone. 5 foot at the base, 10 foot at the end. If you put yourself just above the owl, you could shoot upwards and hit two enemies without hitting the owl. Yeah, I'll do that. You run forward and start channeling your spell. <laughs> okay, for each time you sneeze, all creatures caught in cone take 2d6 points of damage. Successful reflex save half the damage. Reflex for the first one. What am I plusing on this one? You don't roll anything. This is a reflex thing, so they have to roll to get out the way. This is a Flammenwerfer. This is a Flammenwerfer. Okay, so flammen. one of them will take half damage, one of them takes full damage. Roll 2d6 damage, please. This is a Flugzeugwerfer. I can't do this Flugzeugwerfer. The one that's grappling the owl takes four points of damage. The jellyfish looking one that hasn't taken damage yet takes eight. And he has to now make a fortitude save or he gets set on fire. Yeah! <laughs> Die, smelly fish. It is now knocked prone. What, so it's just sort of hanging there on fire? This isn't the spell that where you set them on fire. Sorry, you were talking about that earlier. No. So the jellyfish falls to the ground and since it was up in the air, he's going to take 1d6 falling damage. The jellyfish fish thing is looking definitely worse for the wear as it's writhing around on the floor horribly burnt and a bit bludgeoned from the fall that means Balam, you're up next the one to the side of you the jellyfish is just about to die i will attack the mouth thing okie dokie mouthy mouthy oh i also had a master of a here, so i'll use that so that's a 24 for attack that is a hit you get to roll sneak attack. two plus two to six so that's a total of six damage with a 3d6 that is enough to kill it yeah. So you lunge your shiny new rapier through the horror that is in front of you and you manage to stick it through to the other side as it just worms and thrashes and snaps and trying to bite your hand off but eventually stops moving as you drop it to the floor. So I threw it on the ground and it died. Yep. Threw it down. Good job. Good riddance. Which means, Frida, you're up next. You see one that is close to dying. You see one has the owl, and the one that tried to vomit all over you guys didn't accomplish anything. <laughs> okay, just working out which one to hit. That slime thing doesn't work with arrows. Is it close to death or is it just... No, the jellyfish that's just beneath it on the map is close to death though. And that's prone right now. So ranged attacks will be harder to hit it with because it's prone. But melee attacks are easier. So you could probably send Teapot on it. Yeah, I'll send Teapot on the jellyfish thing whilst I'll deal with this oozy mess that didn't work with my arrows. And use aggressive thundercloud. Okay. First of all, can you roll for Teapot? She's close enough to be able to get a full round of attack so she gets 3d20 she has two claws and some teeth the last claw attack will hit so roll d4 plus one one <laughs> Plus one, so that's two. Somehow, despite the fact that Jellyfish is on the floor close to death, Teapot only manages to get a light scratch on it. Perhaps it's sliding around on the floor. Perhaps it's just Teapot's a bit afraid of this monstrosity. Either way, she doesn't get a good hit on it, so it is still alive. You said you were using, what, Aggressive Thundercloud? Yes. Why don't you tell me what it does? 3d6 damage. Okay, so it's like a flaming sphere, but electricity. So it takes a reflex save to negate. Uh, I have to roll a reflex save for the slime crawler. That is a miss. Go ahead and roll damage. Okay. 3d6. Come on. So you deal 8 points of damage to it as this ball of electricity just kind of appears where the slime crawler is. So it's just kind of engulfed by this electrical cloud. And yes, would you like to move anywhere or are you happy where you are? I'm standing my ground at the moment. So Amy will now spend the second round on the ritual. So all is going well. Berkeley is up next. Ah, yes, Berkeley. Berkeley's a beast. Yeah, literally. They call him Beastie Berkeley. Berkeley, seeing the carnage in front of him, is going to go for the one closest to death. That's one less enemy, one less threat. He puts on his knuckle dusters and he starts casting the spell Shocking Grasp as the knuckle dusters start to crackle with electricity as he runs forward past Snork underneath the enemy on the ceiling, which is too high up to reach him, and his shocking fist 
thrusts his fist <laughs> into the jellyfish and it's prone, so that is a hit. <laughs> Shocking fist. He has basically combined a melee attack with a um, spell. So he's like special move in his fighting game. All of his special moves are basically spells combined with punches. I cast fists. Yep, that's dead. Electricity pulses through the jellyfish as it just melts and disintegrates into a puddle on the floor. He's like, fuck yeah! You jelly? Yeah, we're all jelly. Yeah. That is the end of the round. So now, who would like to roll a dice for me? Not me. I feel like if I say yes, it's going to be like a one or two. Oh, Pete did. Okay. Nine. Okay, Pete, I need you to roll me a d4, please. No, oh, I was close. <laughs> I was with under 10s. Four. That means another creature starts to come through the rift this round. Oh no. And it is one of the mouth monsters. The thing that Barlam just killed, another one starts coming through the rift. Uh, it's all I can muster. You are rolling to determine which one came through. Hmm. Up first is the thing attacking the owl. Oh, wait a second. The owl didn't get a go. He's going to try and get out of the grab and fail. He can still make one attack at least. Nope, that's a miss. Okay, so the owl is... Is completely helpless right now as it's trapped by this thing that now that it has grappled him is going to start draining its blood so it takes three damage from that it loses a point of constitution and parts of its tentacles are grappling the owl the rest of them are going to start slinking down to try and hit berkeley only two of his tentacles come down that's a crit let's confirm that's a confirmation so he's not expecting to be hit from from above as one of the tentacles comes down and whacks him round the back of the head for eight points of damage. Okay, this is kind of dragging a bit. Should we just go a bit more rules light and a bit more dynamic? Yeah. Wait, I, I personally want to say yeah. Basically, less dice rolls, more just flat role playing. Yeah. Okay, so we'll still keep turn order. It's just this is taking a while. You guys complained last time that a fight took too long. So continue. The thing that just came out is going to make a decision, but that is going to go for Amy, I guess. Oh, no. Oh, yes, no. So that attacks Amy, and she drops her spell. Oh, Oh, bloody great. So yeah, next is Slime Crawler. He's going to attack Teapot. Doesn't hit. Alpheus, you're up. Alpheus is going to go as far as he can towards Amy. You can charge all the way round and go for it if you want. If I can charge all the way round, then I will. And try and take on that monster that's just attacked Amy. Roll a d20. I was going to say attack it with my sickle. Five. Rubbish. You manage to get its attention, but you don't manage to get a good hit on it. So you're unable to hit it this turn. What about Snuffles and your centipede? Snuffles is going to go as far as he can towards that creature. Snuffles can go further than you, so he could get to the other side if you like. Brilliant. So he's going to do that and he's going to try and attack the horrible creature. Okay, flat d20. With a four, that's rubbish as well. <laughs> that's also a miss. So you two are trying to protect Amy. You're unable to get a good hit on this thing. Maybe because it's flying over lava, so that makes it difficult, especially for Snuffles. And the centipede is going to go for the creature that's nearest teapot. So roll a d20. Mm-hmm. A six. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, for goodness sake. So the centipede's unable to really do anything against the slime crawler at this time. Yeah, I'm afraid you couldn't manage to do anything, but you did did manage to apply pressure so there's that snork you're up i believe with your fire sneeze you have to sneeze don't you you must sneeze each round as a standard action okay so you don't have to but you can if you like can i move next to the other two and shoot that thing down with another fire sneeze yes you can cool you can't move as far but you can get there Will it land in the lava and kill it? If you knock it prone, so if it fails its save, you will, yes. Four. Well, there's me damage roll for it. So I did manage to roll, I did manage to su succeed with that, so... You mean you, <coughs> you failed it? <laughs> and it died <laughs> I hear that <laughs> so it takes fire damage as you spew fire up at it but it's still floating above the lava you may be able to take it down next turn but it was a close shot so Barlam you're up the crawler right there by teapot is right within stabbing range pretty much I do a flanking stab thing there's a flat d20 for you 11 okay that's a hit with sneak attack you manage to take off like half its health Wow. You just step forward, thrust your sword through this slimy centipede thing, and you're kind of stepping on the jellyfish as well whilst you do this, and you get a good <laughs> shot on it. Yeah. Frida, you're up. 
I'm gonna have to go for that lamprey thing that's attacking, um, whatchamacallit. Amy? Yes, um, Amy with a bow. Okay, roll a flat d20. That's a hit. So, it takes modest damage from your arrow, as it's now surprised to find that the enemy that it was attacking went from being on its own to now it's surrounded. It thought it had an easy prey. Maybe not. Teapot, I assume, is gonna continue going after the crawler? That's the slime thing, right? The slime, yes. Yeah. 3d20s, please. It manages to bite it, and thanks to the damage that Barlam managed to do, that will finish it off. Hey. Bye bye. So next up is Amy. There's the Brazier and Alpheus kind of between them now. She is going to make a five foot step and she's like, I'm so sorry. I'll start it again. And she is going to start up the ritual again to seal the rift. Berkeley's turn. He sees the owl is close to dead. You know, in Super Smash, that kind of giant uppercut that Ganon and Captain Falcon can do? Oh. He's going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's going to be on fire. Wow. So exactly like Captain Falcons. Exactly. And that is a hit that will knock off a sizable portion of its damage. Berkeley will fall back to the ground, however, and he will also take damage from the fall. Berkeley punch. Yeah, basically. He does manage to help the owl get free, so there's that. Oh yeah, it was her turn. He's going to attack... And doesn't do anything. Useless freaking owl. <laughs> That's the end of the round. Someone roll me a d4, please. Do it. Four. Oh, ah. Mm. Another one of those things that just came out. So there's now another one that is coming out. Okay. So the owl gets hit again, taking most of its remaining health. Teapot and Berkeley manage to avoid the tentacles from the ceiling monster. The one that's being attacked by Alpheus and Snuffles and everyone will consider Snork to be the greatest threat and will go at him. Snuffles and Alpheus may make an attack at this time. Attack of opportunity. Can they both do it or is it just one? Yep, both of them can. So roll 2d20. Sweet, then I'll do that. First one will be Alpheus, 20. Oh, correct. Second will be Snuffles, 13. Hey, nice. And roll another roll for Snuffles to see if he can get the trip attack on. Sure, 19. Oh my god. Okay, Alpheus, as it turns round to go after Snork, you manage to cut deep through it with your sickle, and as it screeches out in agony, Snuffles will leap up, bite hold of him, land, swing it around, side to side, and then throw it into the lava, and that will kill it. Wow. Lava, nice day. Uh (laughs) Well, he made a trip attack on a creature into lava, so it's dead. Good job he didn't trip yourself up. Yeah. So this one is going to go for the centipede. And that hits. Uh, Centipede doesn't have much health, so that kills it, I'm afraid. And the jellyfish is still dead. The slime crawler is dead. So that means, Alpheus, you're up. Hmm, choices here. Alpheus is going to try and stay where he is, providing the sling shot will hit him from there, the creature. Yes, you can. Yep, okay, so I'll do that. Just roll a d20. And it's 16. That's a hit. You managed to cheap shot it in the back of the quote unquote head (laughs) as it just finishes off your centipede. Cool. What about snuffs? Snuffs will remain actually where he is. We'll leave it there then. Snork, you're up. There are two enemies left on the field. Where's Amy? Amy is next to Alpheus. She's hiding and she's casting her spell. Yeah, I go next to an I aid her spell. Fantastic. Ooh. What do I need to roll? You don't. D20 in case. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say roll the D20. If you get a crit, you can take two turns off of it. The ritual is now two turns in, thanks to you. So up next is Barlam. There is one hanging from the ceiling, close to dead. And there's one that's about a five foot step from you that's had a rock thrown at it. I'll shoot at the one who's almost dead. Okay using your bow I assume that's 11 that's a hit and that will finish it the kind of rhyming tentacle limbed mess will just squirm and drop to the ceiling drop from the ceiling to the floor like and splatter everywhere teapot is now a lovely shade of crimson Barlam well you were kind of dirty to begin with so it doesn't matter I've got evasion you're fine Berkeley doesn't even care he's just like ha ha brilliant shot Good one, lad. Thank you, thank you. I'm not looking forward to the bath I'm having to give the animals later. Frida, you and Teapot are up. There's one enemy on the map right now. Isn't aggressive thundercloud a continuous attack? It is, and it will only use your move action to move it over the enemy. Okay, I'll do that then. I will make a reflex save. He will successfully avoid it, so for this round, it's unable to harm him. Aw. So you may still make a bow attack, though. Okay, fair enough. Roll a d20. Yay. So you... 
uh, too busy concentrating on this thunderclap spell so when you take a shot it does go wide and just kind of misses teapot is able to act though so she can make an attack she does have to move a bit so roll the d20 and that's a hit so this thing has taken a little bit of damage it's not on death's door but it isn't doing well amy is up she continues the spell the owl will now try to swing around get into flanking with teapot to help her and <laughs> falls into lava and dies. Who falls? The owl. Right. The Edelon that has done literally nothing this entire fight. This beautiful golden owl swoops down from the ceiling to attack this mouthy monster but it dodges it as it basically plunges face first into the acid and the owl just lets out a pitiful Ooh. Oh, I think he committed foul. That was a foul play. That was a foul joke. Yeah, I know. Yes. Berkeley's just like okay then. Right, let's punch this thing now. <laughs> he, he doesn't have much sympathy, but he's like, punch! <laughs> well, he's not quite sure what to say to that, so he's gonna run forward an uppercut, which will miss. So, that's unfortunate. And that's the end of the round. So, I'm gonna present you guys with an option at this point. You have successfully pushed the enemies down to the point where at most they're gonna have two enemies on the field at one time. Since there's pretty much eight of you against one of it, it's gonna be a situation where each round you manage to just just destroy whatever comes through. Would you like to fast forward to the final round? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, another half dozen rounds will pass as more and more enemies come flooding through the gate. Luckily, the tear doesn't seem to be too big, so you're able to fend them off one at a time as Snork and eventually Berkeley will help speed the spell up a bit. Everything that comes through gets hit by lightning, it gets hit by animal teeth, it will get hit by silver arrows and Alpheus's stun and eventually there's just like this big old pile of monstrous corpses just surrounding the rift. But finally, as the spell reaches its completion, as Amy, Snork and Berkeley all finish their incantation, you see as the magic from the three arcane casters illuminates around the edge of the rift. It glows a bright white mixed with purples and golds as the rift starts to be pulled shut as if someone or something has grabbed both parts and is pulling them back together. You see creatures trying to come out but unable to as the bright light is holding them in place and eventually as it gets smaller and smaller as things just get pulled further and back in, it is sealed and the battle is over, the day is won. Huzzah! Yeah. Well done, you guys managed to thoroughly thrash that. I did try to speed it up because I thought it was starting to get a bit boring. And we did it. You did it. Also, also, is this Dragon Age Inquisition? What do you mean? Is this Dragon Age Inquisition? We're fighting off monsters, closing portals. I don't know. I haven't played Dragon Age Inquisition. Ooh, it's more like Portal. I don't have a system <laughs> capable of playing None again. of you guys have played Dragon Age Inquisition. No, I didn't get on with Dragon Age 2, to be honest. I have it. I still haven't played it. I only played Origins. Yeah. Anyway, carry on. Not missing much. Fair enough. So, yes, you've managed to succeed. Most of you have taken a few extra hits during the time whilst the spell was being prepared. So, I imagine all of you have taken at least a little bit of damage even Frida and Teapot who seem to be the healthiest so you're pretty tired your spells are exhausted yeah I'm just going around to seeing who needs attending and using a heal skill no one requires emergency care they're kind of beaten and burnt and bruised it's kind of the damage that will heal with time and yes so now you're just in this room with spikes and lava and there's nothing in the cage woohoo so that's that then. I think maybe we should get out of here. What do you guys think? Yeah, push the corpses into the lava and go. Good idea. Do you want to head back to the top of the tower and have some tea? <laughs> <laughs> Is that tea even safe? Just add up the thing and go home. Well, Berkeley seems fine after stuffing his face. Good idea. No, oh, it was amazing. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's 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 do that and just get some well-earned rest. And bacon. And bacon. You all leave the tower. Due to the cautious nature of the group, you probably decide against finishing whatever tea or cake is up on the roof and just decide to settle on whatever food you brought and the campsite that you've got set up outside. Snork's dog is waiting there happily as is your horse. You manage to see now that whilst the corruption hasn't gone, it doesn't seem as bad as it was. Amy just looks over at you all and smiles. She's like, I know it seems bad, but we've cut off the source. Kyrad has successfully contained the damage and we'll be able to get some master druids in here to clean this up. 
At last. It will take a few months, but things will get better. You all did a fantastic job. You've saved this area, this whole region. Woohoo! Then all that needs to be done is uh, me to check in with my master, report back in, say what happened, and that'll be it. Well, actually, that's not quite true. We've got Esme's corpse, you have the mystery of Elros, and I have this letter that needs delivering. Well, here in next, sir. Alpheus turns around to find someone leaning against the tower walls. It's none other than the courier, Quaver. Good day, my cheesy fellow. You've got something on your face, sir. Oh yeah, this is a bit of blood and bruising. Don't, don't worry about that. I have a letter that needs delivering. Oh, I've only just come back from the previous letter, sir. Look, I'm out of spells and out of luck. Help a doge out here. Very well, sir. But it will cost you. How did it go with Miss Walker's, by the way? Oh, wonderful, sir. She accompanied me as I delivered your previous letter. We had such fun. Yeah, uh, I'm sure you did. So, um, what will it be? You know what, sir? I've changed my mind. You helped me out so much with Miss Walker's. I'll do this one for free. Alpheus hands quaver the letter. This one's going to Wolf Hill. Oh, the one that's kind of northwest of here, sir. That one's not too far. Yes, make sure it gets to Digby. Arter Digby. Very well, sir. Ta-ta, everyone. Have a good time. Alpheus waves him off. What a weird fellow for hanging out at Tower. You must like the architecture. While I'm slicing a smoke. Eh. Oh, home's a safe place, don't worry. Alpheus is also yeah. lighting up a uh, very bizarre looking smoke. <laughs> oh, I slap it out of your mouth. No, bad dog. But I'm a druid. <laughs> but you're not a smoker. I have special needs. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> Sit. Alpheus sits. <laughs> now, don't smoke again. I continue smoking. Well, you guys, whilst everyone's just kind of unwinding, resting, cooking up whatever food you've got. I'm washing the pets who are not pleased. Washing the pets and the doge. Berkeley pulls out of his pack a high quality bottle of whiskey and says, like, I think celebrations are in order, don't you? Dwarfed up tea! Yeah. Oh, this is no tea, friend. This is the good stuff. You added to tea though. And he is going to pour everyone a drink and raise up his glass. He's just like, well, you guys, you did something special today. Uh, yes, it certainly was. I'll, 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 I'll believe it when bleed things and mutations stop. Thank you. I think we'll just let Kyrad and Amy deal with that. I mean, we've punched enough things in the face for today. I'm not extremely pleased that the old saggy woman got away. So it's a bit of a fashion victory to me. I take one sniff of the whisking and go, strong stuff. I drink half the bottle out of habit, like one glug. Okay. Your characters will probably want downtime, just to kind of rest and relax. Yeah, probably. Enjoy, enjoy the fruits of their labour, because you guys will have made money out of this. You know who Rachel Riley is? No. Countdown lady, blonde one. No, I, I don't know. Lady. I don't watch Countdown. I know, but you, know, you should know who Rachel Riley is. Did it, did it. I know of Carol Vorderman. Do you know who Rachel Riley is? No. You seriously don't know who Rachel Riley is? No, I don't know. What? Where have you guys been living? She's like the hottest piece of eye candy on TV at the moment for all the old people. Wow. So you, why are you bringing her up? She's really good at maths and stuff like that. That's why she's on Countdown. But um, the weirdest thing she's ever done, she gave um, Stephen Hawking's a private dance. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's all right because goblin hookers are like really cheap. It's because only really a goblin or an orc could love a goblin. Hmm. <laughs> and with that, the curtain will close on tonight's session as the group will drink, they'll chat, they'll just kind of decompress from the events of the day. Hey. There you go. Thank you all for playing. It's all right. It's cool. It's thanks Thank for... You. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Ah. We stayed a while and listened. <laughs> yeah, we stayed a while. Goodbye, all. Why, hello there. It's Edgar here for some post-podcast credits. Starting off with the main tune, we have Bing Bang Bong by Dave James and Keith Puvez, followed by Jeff Jeff Funk. Hmm. I don't know a funky Jeff, but maybe you do. No, it's Jazz Funk by Steph Sachs Awol. Then in chronological order, we have Mist on the Moor by Kevin McLeod, Sheer Drop by Richard Lacey and Sarah McDonald, Crusade by Kevin McLeod, Devastation and Revenge by Kevin McLeod, Battle of Kings by Perk Stuff at Machinima Sounds, The Moonlight Huntress, the main battle tune used by Peter Crowley, followed by Curse of the Scarab by Kevin McLeod, and Long Road Ahead by Kevin McLeod. Finally, because I forgot to mention it last episode because I'm a massive derp, we have Dear Friends, originally from 
from Final Fantasy V by Nobu Umatsu and played in the previous episode when Alpheus writes a letter by Nujik Takteo and uploaded by Yujin Imanishi. The S effects are by the Guild of Ambience, the MS sound effects and some by myself. Most tracks are free to use or have had a payment for usage. Although some fall under a Creative Commons CC BY NC ND license. Steve. Steve. Take it away, Steve. Hey everyone, thank you for listening to the Band of Others podcast. If you enjoyed the show and want to be really awesome, please leave a review to let others know how much you enjoyed it. We're still a really small podcast, so this will help us get noticed by more people and help us grow. You can also spread the love by tweeting about us using the Band of Bothers hashtag and let all your followers know about how awesome or stupid you think we are. Fun fact, I am really bad at coming up with names for the NPC characters, so if anyone leaves a review or tweets about us using that hashtag, I'll be sure to name an NPC after you, so that way you too can be a part of this game. If you'd like to message us directly about either Band of Bothers or Charisma Check, please email us at bandofbotherspodcast at gmail.com. That's bandofbotherspodcast at gmail.com, or one word. You can also find us in most forms of social media under the name Band of Bothers or Band of Bothers Podcast. Links will be in the description for the episode. So, from me and the rest of the Band of Bothers cast, thank you for listening and goodbye!